We are going to spend 30 minutes making you feel smarter. Become the smartest person in the room by listening to Daily Tech News Show because we just will constantly keep you up to date on things, explain things. We're going to talk about the Facebook Libra Senate hearing. We're going to talk about a threat to chip production in South Korea from Japan. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Security researcher Laxman Mutia earned a $30,000 bug bounty from Facebook for discovering a way around Instagram's mobile password recovery. Instagram sends a six-digit code to your phone number that you must enter within 10 minutes in order to access your account if you forget your password. To brute force that, you need to try one million or so possibilities, so that would be hard in, in theory, and Instagram rate-limited attempts by IP address, so... Mattia sent concurrent requests to double the number of possible attempts and spent $150 on a cloud service to switch IP addresses. Instagram has addressed and fixed the issue. I mean, that, that's pretty much good news, right? Because they he yeah. found the vulnerability before the bad guys got Absolutely. it fixed. Absolutely, and, yeah. and, and was pretty clever about it. Mm -hmm. Amazon is facing an antitrust probe in the European Union. Sources tell Bloomberg a formal investigation may begin within a few days. The EU's competition division head for the time being until the new parliament replaces her. Marguerite Vestager previously said she wanted to escalate a preliminary inquiry into how Amazon might unfairly use its sales data to undercut smaller shops in its marketplace. It would be the first time the EU has directly targeted Amazon's business model, but the third time the company has been investigated by the regulator. A lot of the same talking points as some of the modern presidential camp uh, candidates as well. Ride hailing app Gozum is uh, adding the ability to order auto rickshaws to its motorcycle and car ordering options in Lome, Togo, and Kantanu, Benin. Uh, an auto rickshaw can carry three passengers in covered seating, usually cheaper than a motorcycle taxi. Sources tell Bloomberg that Apple's planning to fund original exclusive podcasts, kind of mirroring what we've heard that competitors Spotify and Stitcher have been doing for some time. Apple execs reportedly have reached out to media companies about grabbing exclusive rights to podcasts that they're interested in. Apple's podcast app still takes around 50 to 70 percent of listening for most podcasts. That's according to industry executives. Should I do the clickbait headline? You know, keep us out of Apple's hands. Support us on Patreon. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just telling you, I'll sell out. So Apple give yeah. me full. Yeah, I'm like, do do you, but I got a variety of podcasts. What do you want, Apple? Like, I can keep doing DTS. <laughs> what do you need? What do you need? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's talk a little more about uh Alphabet with a significant uh milestone in drone delivery. Uh Alphabet subsidiary Wing launched a new app called Open Sky, designed to serve as an air traffic control system to manage the expected growth of flying devices. Open Sky is a free app for the PC, Android, and iOS approved to manage drone flights in Australia. Wing is working with U.S. Federal Aviation Administration to get the app approved, as well as other countries. Competing companies such as AirMap and Iris Automation are also developing similar products to keep drones safe during auto flights and are conducting tests with the FAA as well. Yeah, so this is this is a big problem with drone delivery is uh, air traffic control. Uh, yeah. Yes, it has to do with keeping them out of the way of planes. That is a part of it, but also just you know, making sure they don't run into each other. If you start to have multiple companies doing uh, un unbanned aerial vehicle delivery, uh, you need a way to make sure that they they know what lanes are clear and, and what elevations they should be at. Uh, and that is a thorny problem. So Alphabet having an app that will tie into a system to do that and getting regulatory approval in Australia, I think is a huge step forward towards that day when you can have your burritos and, and your Amazon t-shirt <laughs> delivered by drone. Yeah, and I think that some, some of the, as we all get used to the idea of drones eventually delivering us burritos and other other goods and services, <laughs> you know, the, the, the ongoing question is, but with variety of companies flying through the sky at lower level than, you know, commercial air jets, sure. But still, how are we going to make this all work? And the FAA does need to be involved at this point anyway. And I think that uh, the fact that Alphabet, well, not Alphabet specifically, but Alphabet's wing has, 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 has made the first uh, entry into that into Australia with the eventual uh, goal of being uh, approved in the US and other countries as well as it's kind of the only way to do it. 
Well, I mean, sure. At some point, someone's going to be the vendor that provides this service. And it is indeed a necessary service. The more people build on top of it, I would rather have the infrastructure there in place for the growth to be there because the FAA has historically moved very, very slow with drone rules. And and I, I think the more that the FAA needs to know that this is going to be safe so we can move forward as uh, responsibly, but expediently as possible when it comes to drone delivery, the better we're all going to be. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm jealous of my nephew who lives in Australia because they're going to get this world first. Uh, U.S. will eventually get there. The FAA will drag its heels faster or slower, uh, but it will not get there first. I think you can tell that right now. And so Australia already approving wing to say, great, now we've got an air traffic control system. We can start testing it, uh, you know, start improving it make sure that people can work with it. Uh, I, that gives them a huge leg up. Uh, but eventually, I think it's going to come to a lot of places. I mean, whatever. I, they they lost a war to emus. Look it up. I also imagine, you know, you you know, you know, see in movies, you know, where like like the love struck couple like on the on the back of a car watches the planes go overhead near the airport. It's like, what what is going to be that version of... You won't have to go to the airport watch. anymore. You just go out in your front yard. But, well, because you got open the, sky now and you're like, oh, the they're UAB. coming, they're coming. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah, let's all get, you know... It's, it's and have a burrito delivered to you while you sit there and watch. It'll be <laughs> I know, exactly. Yeah. As, as, you, as you gaze lovingly into <laughs> your sweetheart's eyes, just a burrito sauce drip just hits you right in the, in the cornea. It's perfect. <laughs> that would be a failure of wing if that were to happen. <laughs> At the DARPA Electronics Resurgence Initiative, or ERI, summit in Detroit, Intel showed its Pohiki Beach neurotrophic computing system that combines 34 Loihi chips 64. to which 64, rather, thank you, uh, Loihi he chips to achieve 8.3 million digital neurons. Now, Intel hopes to reach 100 million neurons later this year, which would, would exceed the number in the human brain. See where we're going with this. Loihi chips have been used to simulate tactical skin sense, control a prosthetic leg, and play foosball. And the new system de delivers 100 times the performance of a conventional CPU in applications like sparse coding and graph search, along with 10,000 times the energy efficiency. The Pohiki Beach system will be available to researchers at the beginning any anyway. Yeah, uh, this is um, this is a big advance in, in in something we haven't talked a lot about. I don't think that the neuromorphic computing system, because uh, this is an attempt to make a system that works like the brain. Yeah. Uh, the brain isn't great at all the things that a current CPU can do, but it's a lot better at some of them. Some of them that Sarah just named uh, now, those those sort of systems uh, that that focus on on certain kinds of applications like sparse coding and graph search and that sort of thing. Our brains are really good at that. And our brains use 20 watts of power and run on burritos. Uh, if you <laughs> could have an Intel system uh, that used 20 watts instead of the megawatts of power that a supercomputer, a supercomputer uses megawatts and megawatts of power and doesn't come close to the amount of power that our brains have, this kind of system promises to be able to do that. I think we've got 80 plus million neurons in our brains. If they get to 100 million neurons by the end of this year, that doesn't mean they immediately can do everything the brain can because we have to also figure out software and a few other things, but it certainly creates a new way of computing that will specialize on certain tasks. And we're getting away from the general purpose computing to quantum computing, which is really good at cryptographic stuff and other kinds of stuff. Neuromorphic computing, which is really good at this kind of graph stuff. Uh, I think we're gonna see a future where there isn't just a CPU inside a device as 20, 30, maybe more years down the road. Uh, look, the, the sky is the limit. Uh, uh, and then the more, I mean, I always love these stories and these are always the, the, the DTNS stories. Like you said earlier, Tom, making you the smartest person in the room, because like at some point there's going to be some breakthrough that will be more commercially viable. And you're going to say, Hey, I heard that first on DTNS. Yeah. Neuromorphic. Remember it right now. Intel and Loihi, which is named after an island that's underwater right now, but uh, don't let that hang you up. Uh, Samsung and SK Hynix have asked South Korea's Fusung Co. to boost supply of a key chip-making chemical called hydrogen fluoride in the wake of Japan's announcement earlier this month that it is restricting and slowing export 
to South Korea of not only hydrogen fluoride, but also certain photoresists used to transfer circuit patterns onto semiconductor wafers uh, and fluorinated polyamides used in smartphone displays. That hydrogen fluoride is used in etching gas that makes chips. Uh, there is a political dispute between Japan and South Korea, depending on who you ask. It's because of different things. Uh, in other words, Japan says one thing, South Korea says another. Uh, but it could impact South Korean chip making in a huge way. So South Korean companies have around four months of supplies. We're not talking about a block right now anyway. We're talking about a slowdown. So that four months is it like, oh, they've got to figure out something else in four months or they're out. But they are looking at alternate supplies of these chemicals from places in China and Taiwan, as well as like Belgium, where Japanese suppliers of these chemicals have non-Japanese operations that might be able to get around the block. And real dumb question, uh, why does South Korea not uh, uh, make these chemicals itself? Well, Probably. I mean, well, that's, a, that's a great question, but every because globalization makes it efficient right. not to have to do everything sure. yourself right of course yeah uh, it's it's the same thing of like well it's not like rare earth where like well china has a bunch of rare earth metals and became really efficient at mining them so they have a domination it's more like oh these japanese companies are really good at it it's cheap to get it from them we'll start ordering it from them and companies in other places aren't as successful as them. It's it's like, why do all the operating systems come for the United States? Not because other countries didn't want to make them. Well, I think part of it that throws me off is the Japan element, because you don't think of Japan as like, well, cheap labor, and that's where, you know, you get a lot of parts for 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 a variety of of, of uh, devices that that get shipped off to other countries. It 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 isn't really the China. It, cheap labor isn't the only reason that Companies yeah. can get good at something. It turns out yeah. technical expertise, handling toxic chemicals, uh, you know, requires smart people. And there was a lot of those kinds of smart people in Japan. And they well, already had the infrastructure for it. So why right, duplicate right. it? Especially yeah. when there's a lot of people who would complain about having a, a floral floral carbon operation in their backyard. Well, and beyond that, it's it's also just you've built your business on buying this product for X amount of money, right? Like that's that's just what you've done. You didn't build a business that said, and then we make our own uh, a photo. Right, right. The supply chain has to be yeah. reimagined. Yeah. Well, right. chip making uh, in Japan has a long history, and and probably uh, companies grew up around that that made these chemicals. And then when South Korea started growing, uh, they're like, well, we can buy them from Japan, and it's affordable to do that. Until you have this political dispute that gets in the way, uh, which you know to tie a bow on this whole story shows that the disputes between the United States and ZTE, the United States and Huawei uh, are not the only disputes. This is starting to become something that other countries are trying. <laughs> yep. Finally, countries aren't getting along. More at 11. <laughs> Microsoft's latest version of Windows 10 due in September will let third-party voice assistants like Amazon and Google's activate on the lock screen. Microsoft has continued to move its own Cortana away from built-in away from the built-in search experience in Windows and put more focus on it as a standalone app and service to be offered for businesses for inclusion in enterprise software. The assistant changes appear to be in the new Windows 10 build uh, released to Windows Insider testers today. Yeah, so the, this is right in the Microsoft uh, Sachin Nadella era playbook. Uh, Cortana as a service to enterprise customers where they make a lot of money and then leave the platform open to choice so that more people want to adopt Windows because, oh, you mean if I get that device, I can choose between Amazon and maybe another, you know, Google or something, although Google isn't on board yet. Uh, yes, I would like to do that. I would like to be on that system that gives me a little more choice. I hesitate to call it open, but it's giving people choice. I mean, well, and Microsoft knows that Cortana is not the front runner uh, as far as digital assistants go, even though it 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 has its loyal fan base for sure. But yeah, this is this is not unlike how I would feel if I was going to buy a new smart speaker. And okay, who makes it? Okay, how, how you know what 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 services does it integrate with? What services do I use already where it will be convenient for me to have those services integrated? And Microsoft saying you know we're we're just going to be the operating system for everybody like whatever you want and yes not all of the assistants are are available at this time but go
going in that direction and saying, okay, well, Cortana is an option, but we, we're sort of moving that into its own standalone world. We're going to make for we're, enterprise. Yeah. Microsoft's like, we'll make more money selling Cortana to enterprise than we will shoving it in your face on windows. And we'll make more money if people want to build a bunch of smart speakers with windows inside that have whatever voice assistant they want than we would if we tried to force everyone to use Cortana there. And exactly. These two, con these two uh, companies, Amazon and Google own the home. That is it. You know, when, when, when the home pod landed like an elongated comical fart, uh, that was kind of it for the next five years that Amazon and Google are there. Windows is very, very smart to make all of their devices now yet another extension of what you're already you many are already running their homes on. Let's talk about grammar, shall we? Indeed. Grammarly is a grammar checking tool that you can use in Microsoft Office and Chrome and Slack and other places. An update to its browser extensions, its web app and native desktop apps extends its function beyond just spelling and punctuation and grammar as it's been known thus far. Grammarly can now highlight unclear phrasing, tone and word choice for varied and engaging writing. You can tell the tool what kind of writing you're doing, such as professional or blogging, who the audience is, those sorts of parameters. Some of the clarity and conciseness help will come free. The rest of it will be part of the paid product. Man, this is the payoff of AI, right? Uh, and this is this is the thing where if you're not a writer who works with editors all the time, you may wonder why you would want this. Uh, but editors are incredibly valuable at helping you sound more like you in a better way. And I don't know how good this works because I haven't tried it, but what Grammarly is promising here is we've got some machine learning that will do that. And you tell us who you're writing for and, and what you're writing, and we will, we will help guide your writing to be better for those purposes. Well, and before the show, Tom was kind of laughing at me because my oh, initial wow. reaction was, well, you, you were, you were snickering a little bit in it, you know, in a lighthearted openly way. Openly guffawing. <laughs> he was, he was openly guffawing at me. Cause I was like, well, I don't want anybody to strip, strip out my language. Like I sound like I sound man. No, but that, I, what but I, I said was, well, Sarah, you don't need this, but other people might. We all do. And, and I think the, the, the likening it to a human editor if and when it becomes as good as a really good human editor is so important. The best writers need editors. Okay. And I, 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 I kind of can't wait to use this tool really, because I think that a lot of us who do especially daily tech news show and, uh, and other regular stuff, we're used to figuring out how to parse a really long thought into a concise sentence and yeah. It's not always about making it shorter, but it's about, yeah, okay, let's, you know, move some words around and, and make it sound a little bit more natural language. And so if Grammarly can 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 kind of figure out how this works, it, it's a really powerful tool. And look, even if you've never worked with an editor and you've never had that very unique experience of, uh, of shaving off parts of your own ego to make your work better by way of somebody who is uh, forcing you to do it, uh, uh, it is. It, it would be great as just a, a general tool. And I look forward to the time when I see a pop-up window saying, it looks like you're trying to write an excoriating tweet thread. Would you like some help with that? <laughs> we, we noticed this sentence was uncharacteristically kind. Would you like us to make it angry? <laughs> yes, exactly. yeah. You you should not post this update. Exactly. <laughs> would you like to abort? This seems very angry. Would you like to share your opinion on Captain Marvel? You will lose 10 followers because of this. Would That's you like to continue? Yes. Uh, <laughs> folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, don't forget we have a partner show at dailytechheadlines.com that keeps you up to date in an efficient manner. It's like neuromorphic headlines for your head in your ears at dailytechheadlines.com. All right. Facebook's head of Calibra, David Marcus, testified to the U.S. Senate Banking Committee Tuesday. I'm going to run through some of the things he said, uh, put some context into some of the outside reactions, and then we'll we'll discuss what we think of this. Uh, all, I, I will say overall, before I get into the statements Marcus made, I was impressed by the Senate. I had no confidence that we would get any useful questions from them. And it turns out we got many useful questions. We also got idiotic questions. We also got senators <laughs> asking Marcus about things that he didn't work on and doesn't know the answer to because they wanted to make a statement. But I was, I was overall very impressed. Uh, Marcus said that only 
Calibra will be built into Messenger and WhatsApp. So there won't be multiple wallets there. Uh, you'll be able to use whatever you wallet you want to trade Libra outside of Messenger and WhatsApp. But if you want an integrated wallet, it's only going to be Calibra. Uh, however, Calibra will interoperate with other Libra wallets. Uh, so Calibra is not going to be the dominant wallet uh, necessarily, unless people choose it that way. Calibra will also offer data portability. So if you want to switch to another wallet, you'll be able to take your data with you. That's a huge uh, concession. I think that's super important. Libra itself will comply with all U.S. regulations and not launch until U.S. lawmakers' concerns have been answered. They're not going to stop working on it, uh, but they are going to, they, they say, work with Congress to make sure this follows the law. Uh, Marcus said it is not the intention at all of Calibra to monetize user data, though it may ask for consent to use data specifically for financial services that it might offer in partnership with other financial orgs. In other words, we're not going to monetize your data, but if you want to get a loan through Calibra at some point, we might partner with a bank and then we'll have to ask you for some data, but we'll make sure we get your consent first. So, so far, so good. Uh, Facebook will let users pay with credit cards and other mediums besides Calibra, was Marcus's answer to the question about whether Facebook will collect data on transactions made with Calibra. That's a fancy way of Marcus avoiding the, the question. Uh, and the answer being, well, yes, Facebook is going to collect data on transactions made with Calibra. But, but you they have also other options. That. Yeah, they do that with your credit card already, too, was kind of what he was saying. Uh, Facebook will not have any special privileges inside the Libra Association. Right now, they're one of 28. They hope to be one of 100 or more. Uh, Facebook's core revenue model around Libra is that more online commerce will lead businesses to spend more on Facebook ads. Uh, this is the loss leader situation. We feel like if we make it easier to spend the money using Calibra, that we get more money from ads over here. It's kind of the Google model on search. They don't charge you for search because they figure having more people searching means they can sell more ads. Uh, Marcus did say he would be willing to be paid in Libra when asked about that. So he, he put his money where his mouth is. Uh, a few times, Marcus implied that if the U.S. doesn't lead on this issue, that some other place will. He didn't say China, but he might as well have. Uh, he would not say how much Facebook has invested in Libra, which is related to how much interest it will make off of its investment in the Libra Association. That's a big one because Facebook also, as a company, will make a lot of money off that interest. Uh, and he didn't really get specific about that. Also, he couldn't explain why the Libra Association is not for profit if members get paid interest. He fumbled that question, too. Uh, when he was asked about freezing assets, Marcus said that wallet providers could do that. Uh, but he did not address non-custodial wallets. In other words, people who create a wallet to trade Libra that aren't part of the Libra Association. Uh, that is a big question a lot of people have because that could be a, a gray area where money laundering could happen. On whether a citizen could get back funds lost to an overseas wallet scam, Marcus basically said, uh, we'll educate people on how to avoid these scams and they should just use protected wallets. Uh, <laughs> if you're in America, use an American wallet, you won't have any trouble, which isn't a terribly satisfying answer. Uh, Marcus also will testify before the U.S. House Committee on Wednesday. A uh, couple of side notes here. U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission Chairman Jay Clayton gets some headlines because he says, I haven't talked to anyone from Facebook about Libra, but Facebook has met with other officials at the SEC, so that feels a little bit like grandstanding. However, Switzerland's Federal Data Protection and Information Commissioner says, quote, we have not been contacted by the promoters of Libra. Facebook confirmed that it has yet to meet with the FDPIC about privacy regulation, even though they say that's the agency that's going to regulate us for privacy. All right, Justin, Sarah, what do you guys think of all this? Oh, Libra. I don't know. I mean, look, it, it, this is a, a good first step. I, I think that uh, uh, by and large, as you mentioned before, it seems as if uh, both Libra and, and Facebook, right, uh, uh, have made a pretty good first uh, impression with the Senate. I think that there's a lot of good information in there. Uh, I wouldn't so much worry about the idea that it's a not-for-profit uh, if they're getting paid interest. There's a lot of people that are in, uh, that are members of not-for-profits that get paid. People who get paid to work at not-for-profits, right? Except interest often is profit. So if you're an investor in a not-for-profit, you don't usually make money off that investment. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Unless there, you can you can justify that as like, hey, look, it, it takes X to maintain optimal best practices on integrating all this, and we're part of the backbone. Yeah. So, I mean, there's probably an answer. He just didn't give it. He didn't. He yeah. didn't. Also, I mean, look at the financial institutions and venture capitalists that are part of the Libra Association. I mean, there there is profit to be made here. It's not out of the goodness of your own heart wanting to, you know, uh, make this cryptocurrency part of the new world. 
The, the one thing I will say is I don't quite buy the idea that, oh, no, we're in it because more people will spend money on Facebook ads. Because with Google, like, yes, you need space. You need real estate to sell ads. There is a direct uh, proportion to how many searches you have versus how many spaces for uh, an ad slot you now generate. It is a fairly one-for-one -one kind of trade. There is no reason to say that Libra will take off and people will be like, oh, it's so great for me to buy Facebook ads with this particular currency, unless for whatever reason they want to offer them cheaper. I, well, I, and that's, no, that's it's not the, about buying the ads with Libra. It's Libra will make it so much easier to buy products on Facebook that it will be very lucrative to buy your ad on Facebook because people are willing to spend there. I don't know that I buy that either, right? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm sure that's part of their calculation. I also think that it's a little disingenuous to imply that 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 is the major calculation because I think that thing he said about partnering with financial institutions on other financial products like loans and stuff is probably at least just as lucrative for Facebook. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned on the show yesterday that you know some of this is I'm still wrapping my head around it because you know it who isn't, uh, but uh, I mean unless you're. A cryptocurrency expert, which I am, you know, I, I am only trying to be one. Uh, the the idea that only Calibra would be built in a messenger and WhatsApp. Okay, I get why the company would want to do that. Um, I get why Calibra would have to offer data portability because you can't just say no. We will hold your data forever. You should be able to leave the system and go to a to another world if you so desire. But what tripped me up. Uh, earlier today was the idea that Calibra will interoperate with other Libra wallets. Because of course, in my mind, I was like, but if they said that they won't, then how do they do that? And it, I have to remind myself that just because you're using Libra doesn't mean you're using it on the Facebook platform. The whole right. idea is that that is only one place that you would use this cryptocurrency. Yeah. It, in fact, I, a few of my takeaways from from this testimony today were it is in Libra Association's interest to quickly have a viable wallet or two or more from trusted non-Facebook companies. Nobody trusts Facebook. Nobody believes that Facebook isn't going to try to find some way around whatever. But if you had PayPal come out, you had Visa come out and say, we're going to have a Libra wallet. It's not going to be used with Facebook. Uh, it's going to be used for these other things. That would help the Libra Association quite a bit. I also think it's essential that somebody else besides Facebook be able to speak to Libra to say like, hey, we yeah, we get it. Nobody trusts Facebook, but here's why we're doing this and we think it's benefit for us, whether it's good for Facebook or not. Uh, and then I think a Facebook representative that is not a Libra or Calibra rep needs to address concerns about what Facebook will do with payment data, uh, maybe even beyond Calibra, because David Marcus, he had some plausible deniability to say, I don't know, that's Facebook. That's what they do. Uh, I'm not going to do that on Calibra. And I, I actually believe that. But there, that leaves a, a, a whole section of Facebook that can do some stuff with your Calibra payments once you use them through Facebook. And I want to know what they're going to do with that, too. Thanks, yeah. everybody who participates in our subreddit, Crypto Stories and others. You can submit whatever you are most interested in, what you'd like us to talk about, and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. Ken wrote in and said, uh, he had a couple points. First, he said, really good interview to Tom about e-waste. One thing that the guest said that optical scanning had difficulty with black plastic. Is it possible to take a page from astronomers who do spectroscopic scans and can read the chemical composition of stars? If they can chemically analyze stars light years away, why not trash mere feet away? Uh, it's 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 a whole different level of you know <laughs> you could you could basically with a spectroscopic scan tell it's plastic, but not necessarily what kind of plastic. It's it's a whole different level of of goal there. Uh, it's an interesting thought though. I mean, maybe there's something to it. I don't know. Ken also said a uh, good question to Sarah about the appeal of desktop Twitter. I had asked yesterday who uses it and why not that you shouldn't, but just why Ken says, aside from not worrying about when Twitter will change enough to break yet another third party app. I like the ability to translate a tweet from a single click of the translate link. I can understand Patrick Bejad's tweets in French. For example, hmm. they added the ability to the mobile version, but that requires two clicks on a tweet. So he prefers the desktop version. 
Oh, and then Caleb uh, said, I'm currently using the new Twitter site layout and I rather like it. The leading win for me is that now there's a single place to look to to start a new tweet. Before I had to look for the text box or the floating quill pen button. While not difficult, it often would be in the way and I'd need to scroll around to see something unobstructed. So yeah, the tweets are smaller, but the interface is easier to read. Thank you. Caleb. Uh, and wait, before you let Justin plug anything, I want to read Tony's email. Tony writes, one of my favorite things about the show is that you are independent and unbiased. The more I listened to the show, the more I saw that. That alone is a rare commodity in media today. Through the show, I met and came to enjoy your regular guests, Scott Johnson, Patrick Beja, Len Peralta, and we can't forget Justin R. Young from PX3. You even give me some Patrick Norton from time to time. I was a free listener for a while, mainly because money was tight. But at some point, you released into the feed an abbreviated Good Day Internet show. I think it was a retro episode. And I love to hear you guys struggle with doing that show and not talking about current technology. It made me chuckle, and you guys did an impressive job. That show allowed me to see another side of you all. It showed me you were genuine and that you really loved what you did. I thought, this show can't die. I need to do something. I signed up on Patreon and donated at the highest level I could afford. Once I signed on and got the GDI feed, I realized how much I'd been missing. And I, my level, at my level, I get the weekly talk and Shannon Morse's threat wire piece is great. I also now am a regular subscriber to PX3, mainly because like you, Jury is pretty unbiased in his opinions, an even rarer commodity in today's day. I recently commissioned Len Peralta to do a caricature for my real estate business. A good artist is a rare find. So thanks for bringing him into my life too. Thank you so much, Tony, for that. It's the best email I had all day. Yeah. I would like to thank Tony for that as well. That is very, very nice. And uh, I greatly appreciate the kind of feedback, to be totally honest. Uh, I will say that I have based so much of the stuff that I have done based on the various versions of Tom's shows. It has been a an absolute pleasure to be a part of so much of uh, a, a Daily Tech News show. And, and I'm glad that there is a glide path between DTNS and PX3, which, by the way, you can find on all your favorite podcasting platforms. And if you don't like podcasting for some reason and you're just listening to this because you're being held hostage, you can <laughs> read some of my political hot takes. I'm posting them now, uh, not only on my free political newsletter at freepoliticalnewsletter.com, but you can check out some of them at politicspoliticspolitics.com. It's an active blog now. Hey, folks, uh, be like Tony, support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. And whether you do or not, tell us what you think in our mid-year survey. We're asking you some questions to help us figure out how to make the show better and better at dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. Got a lot of feedback in the last 24 hours. Keep it coming because it makes us happy. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is our email address. If you'd like to join us live, we are live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Time Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>